acceleration is really the new constant. Black swan events, fat tail events like the pandemic may become increasingly common as we move into the future. And that changes the expectations that are being placed on corporate directors. Welcome to the Innovation and Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Joshua Nunziato. He is at the University of Colorado, and he's going to talk to us about a very innovative new course offering that he has been involved with and will roll out just, I would say, in a couple of months, but actually it'll be next month by the time this podcast is posted. So first of all, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you, Tom. It's really a pleasure. So could you tell us a little bit about your academic and professional background? Yeah. So I am a philosopher, both by uh, training and profession. I had the honor of teaching courses in business ethics, ethical leadership, and sustainability at the Leeds School of Business at CU across both the undergraduate and graduate curriculum. I earned my PhD in philosophy from Villanova. So it's really fun to be uh, kind of the, the resident philosopher working with a bunch of business-minded folks. That is really interesting. That I'm sure the conversations when you either can or used to get together were were really fascinating just simply because the difference in disparate backgrounds that you guys would both have. So uh, perhaps you can enlighten us a little bit about that. But could you tell us your current research focus? Yeah. So I focus on contemplative practice as a catalyst for the ethical formation of professionals. So what that means is I look at a range of different disciplines ranging from philosophical dialectic, prayer, memento mori, the practice of becoming aware of and acknowledging one's mortality, a range of other practices, and consider the role that they can play in shaping business people to act in more ethical and sustainable ways. So you wrote a dissertation which formed the basis of a book you wrote called Augustine and the Economy of Sacrifice. Could you tell us a little bit about that book, what it's about, who it's aimed for, and what the response has been? that surprised you the most? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is very much part of this larger project I just described, looking at how contemplative practice can shape professional decision making. The reason it focuses on sacrifice is that while it is pervasive in contemporary business practice, we're always having to make trade-offs. Normally those trade-offs are conceptualized as private or corporate losses that are accepted for some greater good we hope to achieve by making the sacrifice. But there is a longer wisdom tradition as reflected in St. Augustine, but also a number of other traditions outside of the Catholic philosophy that he represented, including the Indian wisdom tradition in texts like the Bhagavad Gita that actually see sacrifice somewhat differently. And I think contemporary business professionals might have much to learn by reframing sacrifice as an offering that individuals and corporations can make for the common good. So that shift from seeing sacrifice in business as a private loss for a greater good to seeing it as an offering for the sake of the common good, recognizing the community to which you belong and its flourishing as really what motivates the sacrifice is really what the book is all about. And in an age where the shift is to sustainability is becoming increasingly urgent, I think we need to give a lot more thought to the sacrifices that we're making. And so the intention of the book is to help people a little bit further down that road. So in terms of the community you spoke of, under a kind of a Milton Friedman theory, the community really consisted only of the shareholders. The Business Roundtable and their statement on the purpose of a corporation expanded that to a series of stakeholders, employees, local communities, third parties you may be doing business with, certainly shareholders, and perhaps others. Do you see the community you talked about as a larger community, or is it more limited to those with a vested financial interest? Excellent. So it absolutely includes those with a financial interest, investors. 
but the community, the business community for which I think executives need to be increasingly managing absolutely includes that much broader stakeholder ecosystem that the Business Roundtable is encouraging uh, leaders to focus on. And of course, many other leaders like Larry Fink are really encouraging that kind of shift toward a much broader aperture in terms of the responsibilities of executives and directors. I think the COVID pandemic has brought home very painfully for all of us that we really are all in this together, whether we want to be or not. And I think as more and more managers kind of grapple with what that means, they need tools for thinking through the new broader set of responsibilities that that stakeholder focus entails. Earlier this week, I interviewed the head of an MBA program at a small liberal arts college near my hometown, and they had rolled out an MBA program for the first time. And I asked him what was the focus, or rather, the focus was on business ethics. And I asked him why that was his focus. He said in, the, in surveying local and regional businesses in West Texas, the single thing that they heard consistently was business owners wanted ethical graduate students graduating because they felt if they had a basic understanding of business or just ethics, they wouldn't make bad ethical decisions leading to legal violations. And I wanted to maybe use that as a way to introduce the program you've worked on at CU that you're rolling out, Ethical Leadership for Corporate Directors. First of all, what was the genesis or who had the idea to help corporate leaders, corporate directors with this? Yeah, so uh, Keith Darcy, a mutual friend of ours and a godfather in the compliance profession, was part of the kind of originating genius behind the program. Also, Professor Mark Meany, one of my colleagues, sadly now deceased at CU, were both instrumental in pulling this together. And really, the idea behind it was that against the backdrop of the pandemic, racial unrest, political tensions, this accelerating rate of change that corporate directors are being asked to respond to with integrity, these directors need tools and they need insights to understand the structural changes that are shaping the challenges that their companies are facing and really respond in a way that they have not been challenged to respond by the status quo in the past. So we really want to help leaders who participate in our program to understand that acceleration is really the new constant. Black swan events, fat tail events like the pandemic may become increasingly common as we move into the future. And that changes the expectations that are being placed on corporate directors. And of course, it's not just those macro level events. It's also, as we talked about a minute ago, the increasing expectation of a whole range of stakeholders that businesses really step up and do more to both evaluate their environmental and social impact and make sure that that impact represents an overall net good for society. So against those both macro and firm level pressures, we feel like the traditional approach to corporate director education simply doesn't offer the forward-looking tools that directors need to navigate the current environment. And so we wanted to offer a program that would provide directors the insights they need. So perhaps the most prescient comment I heard coming into and out of the pandemic was we've moved from disaster recovery to business continuity to business as usual, uh, which means exactly what I think you said. There are no black spawn events. They're just events. And how you respond to those events may well determine your legal response. It may determine your reputational response. It may determine a wide variety of responses. If I can overlay that with, I've studied corporate governance for some time now, and the last frontier for me has been corporate directors. What used to be thought of as an a all-star corporate director list typically contained people who did not have these specific skills. And I won't name any of the, the companies, but you named the scandal and their board was A-listers who really had no clue what was going on either down to the micro level or even really at the macro level. So I really applaud this effort to bring this to a corporate director's how have you structured the subject matter of the course so that they understand 
literally their role as oversight, but even if they want to test, moving down to that micro level of testing that a board must sometimes do. Absolutely. So the course will start with a high level look at the factors that are driving the accelerating rate of change and introducing new challenges that boards are now having to grapple with. Of course, the basic responsibilities of boards to exercise oversight, control, accountability, those remain the same. And so after we've introduced the backdrop of accelerating change, we want to provide an orientation or a reorientation to board members or aspiring board members about what those core responsibilities are. But we also want to help them understand that those core responsibilities of directors are now being applied to solve and respond to new challenges. In other words, looking at sustainability and ESG, which will form the middle part of our course, these are new expectations just in the last really five to 10 years that this has really taken off and gained traction. The fact that boards are now being asked to oversee executives who are being asked to manage and report out the environmental and social impacts of their organizations mean that those directors exercising the traditional functions of corporate guidance and oversight need to understand what new standards they are holding their C-suite to so that they can ask the right questions and benchmark their performance. And so we're going to take a deep dive into topics like diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to look at integrated reporting and the emergence of new styles of impact investing and ESG finance. We're even going to take a look at some issues in Web 3.0, all of the issues around blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which have been very much buzzwords, but which we believe will over the next 5, 10 or more years really reshape the way that trust is distributed in organizations. And board members need to know that. They need to have a deeper familiarity with what these emerging technologies are. They don't need to be specialists, but they need to have the background necessary to ask the right questions of their executive teams, of others in the organization, chief compliance officers, and so on. And then in the last part of the course, we're going to look at principles of open-hearted ethical leadership to uh, form cultures that are vibrant, healthy, and high integrity. And we think that that package is really going to offer a blend of what have always been the responsibilities of directors, but applied to these new challenges and opportunities in the current moment. Could you tell us the structure of the teaching? Will it be live in person from time to time? Will it be virtual? How do you uh, plan to structure this course? It will be, yes. So we have a residential component planned for Saturday and Sunday, March 19th and 20th, and that'll be hosted here in beautiful Boulder, Colorado, Elite School of Business. We will be conducting that in a pandemic safe environment with appropriate safety protocols in place to keep people safe and healthy. But then after that in-person opportunity to get to know each other, to frame the issues of the course, and to start diving in, we will have five weekly Zoom virtual synchronous sessions. So people will all be there together. It won't be pre recorded content, but it will be hosted online. Those will be on subsequent Wednesday mornings for three hour blocks, five weeks in a row. That package will constitute about 27 contact hours. But of course, the leads faculty members who will be teaching this will be available for after the fact, you know, consultations, conversation, advising on an as-needed basis for any participants who might be interested. I should also mention that while Keith Darcy and I will be co-facilitating, we will be drawing on our world-class faculty at the Leeds School of Business who will be helping to teach the program and coming in to deliver select segments. So for instance, Stephanie K. Johnson, who is a world expert on diversity, equity, and inclusion, will be delivering our class segment on that topic. Eric Alston, who is a legal scholar with extensive background in Web 3.0, will be coming to provide an orientation on that. So we're going to be really drawing on the expertise represented by our faculty. And we're also going to have some really all-star guest speakers coming in as well. Richard Steele, who's the CEO of Parsec Ventures, a board member at multiple firms, he's going to be coming in to give a talk. 
based on his book, Elevated Economics. And so we're going to have some really exciting guest speakers as well. So I think you've answered this question several times, but I'm going to ask it directly so that we get it in one place, which is, why is this course offering so relevant in 2022? Great question. As we emerge from the kind of crisis mode of the pandemic, a lot of market jitters, interest rates are going up, high inflation, geopolitical tensions. There is a lot of change, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility, and a lot of potential threats that board members are having to face. And so we really believe that it is vital for those board members to responsibly exercise their duties as directors of corporations to have the tools that they need to understand the forces driving those changes and then be able to apply that to situate their company against that bigger backdrop and be able to ask the right questions and provide high integrity leadership that will be forward looking rather than backward looking. There are a lot of really high quality educational programs out there for corporate directors. However, most of them tend to be fairly traditionalist and frankly, somewhat conservative in their orientation. And that is not bad. However, we believe it isn't sufficient to provide board members what they need to navigate this new environment. And so this provides some forward looking, innovative tools that frankly, I don't think are on offer in a lot of other places at this time that we think board members who are really looking to elevate their game and equip themselves to navigate this new environment will find extremely useful. Maybe I could turn a little bit to ESG. And you've talked about sustainability, you've talked about environmental. Obviously, we're talking about corporate governance throughout this, but where do you see the role of the board or even a corporate leader in ESG going forward? So your listeners may already know that ESG is an acronym, Environmental, Social, and Governance, and that's become increasingly the boxes into which sustainability is being organized, so to speak, integrated reports and other places. The specific form that ESG leadership will take is going to depend a lot on the industry, the leader's role in the organization. But I would say at a top level, ESG sustainable leadership means, from my perspective, the ability to respond to the real needs and wants of that broad stakeholder ecosystem you described earlier, and to do it with compassionate pragmatism. So what I mean by that is corporate leaders are able to weigh up and evaluate the comprehensive impact that their decisions are having on the environment, on local communities, on their employees, on their suppliers, on their customers, and yes, on their investors, and really take in, in a comprehensive way, the net impact for good or ill that their decisions are having, and try to really manage both what they can measure, as well as the important things that they can't. You know, there's this old saying that you can only manage what you can measure. If that's true, we're in deep trouble because a lot of the important ethical responsibilities that corporate leaders have to their stakeholder system simply cannot be measured. Now, that said, there is a lot of really exciting innovation that is going on to capture and quantify environmental and social and governance performance and to report that out and to manage to it in ways that corporate leaders have never been able to do before. So I don't in any way want to short sell the value and the importance of that integrated reporting approach to ESG management, where people are really giving a comprehensive picture of the financial, environmental, social, and governance performance. But it's a both and situation. Corporate leaders need to be able to ask, what are we measuring that we need to continue measuring and improving on? What are we not measuring that we need to start measuring and managing to? And then what are the ethical commitments we have that we simply can't quantify, but we still need to acknowledge in our corporate decision making? We think all three of those are really vital. And you need kind of a different set of tools for tackling all three of those facets of 
sustainable leadership in business. I apologize because I see now I should have brushed up on my Augustine before this podcast, and it's been a while since I've studied it. And my focus, as you might guess, was, was really in the law. But listening to you, it strikes me that Augustine really speaks to a lot of these issues. And you use the word pragmatism. Mm -hmm. That was really the one key concept I took away from my reading of Augustine. Would it be fair to say, not that he presages ESG, but he certainly influences how we can think about it in a very different way? Yeah, it's a fascinating insight. I'd love to hear more about how pragmatism stood out as a core value for you in reading Augustine. But one of the key insights of perhaps one of Augustine's most well-known works, The City of God, is this idea that what we love organizes our society, it organizes our politics, and by extension, it organizes our business and our economy. So objects of shared love and desire are really, really important. Getting clarity about those are really, really important for ethical leadership. And so I think I would situate this conversation about sustainability in relationship to Augustine around the goal of inclusive prosperity. Augustine, way back in his day, in the, the kind of waning years of the Roman Empire, was really looking at the collapse of this long-standing set of institutions and trying to make sense of what came next. And I think, you know, in our era where we are arguably in the twilight of many of our institutions in their existing forms, both in business, politics, culture, and elsewhere, we're trying to make sense of what comes next, asking what do we as communities, as a business community, as a firm, as people who live with neighbors and connect in a whole range of different social dynamics, what do we care about? What are the values that can gather us in joint efforts that are moving us toward shared, enduring prosperity? I think those are really important questions that we're just now beginning to ask and really grapple with seriously. You kind of have to know the right questions to ask before you can start figuring out the answers together. So most of my professional career, I worked in and around the energy industry, both as a trial lawyer, defending cases, and in-house as well. And I started my compliance journey in anti-corruption compliance, trying to fight the international scourge of bribery and corruption. And I found that working inside the corporate format, whether through you compliance program or, or some other format, was a way that I could impact that international scourge. So I really wanted to say that as an introduction to ask you why or how do you see corporate America taking the lead on so many other issues now? And more importantly, what's the role of a philosopher in either advising, counseling, or even having these discussions with corporate leaders and boards of directors? Great question. You know, to be honest, Tom, I'm not sure that I see America taking the lead on ESG or sustainability issues per se. I think that honor probably goes to our European colleagues over the pond from us. However, that said, we are definitely leading relative to a lot of other economies worldwide that are really struggling to get their people up or significant parts of their population into the global middle class. So there is a lot of innovation on these issues that is happening in the US. But I think really the short answer to the question of why we're starting to see leadership on these issues of ethics and sustainability is simply that inaction is not an option anymore. I think the, the impact of our corporate decisions that have been made over decades on the environment are just becoming increasingly painfully obvious to people across the political spectrum and people are feeling an urgent need, they're recognizing the urgent need to respond and also recognizing that if they don't, the long-term viability, but certainly the inclusive prosperity of the society they're leaving their kids is very much in jeopardy. So a short answer is, I don't think we have an option not to step up in these spaces and lead with ethical conviction to address the crises of our moment. But on the, the governance side, you know, it's not just environmental crises we're facing. On the board level, 
I think of recent scandals like the Activision sexual harassment problems that have recently come out as reported by the Wall Street Journal and the really failure of oversight of the leadership team there at Activision, that has consequences for the individuals involved and impacted by the culture there at Activision Blizzard, but ultimately it also has profound ramifications for the business. You know, your stock price goes down and you get bought out by a large competitor. Those are direct consequences that come from failures of ethical leadership at the board level, exercising those responsibilities of compliance and oversight to make sure that sexual harassment is being handled properly, for instance, just to give one example and not to pick on them, we could identify any number of other examples, but it's one that's been in the news recently. So what do philosophers have to offer here? Well, philosophers are in the business of asking questions that lead people to greater perspective and illumination than they would have otherwise had access to. So I really see my primary role as expanding the moral imagination of the people that I teach and work with so that they can ask the right questions and consider possibilities for ethical and sustainable leadership that might not otherwise have been on their radar. Joshua, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode. But before we go, I was wondering if anyone wanted to follow up with yourself on any of the topics you've raised, or more importantly, they wanted more information on the course offering, Ethical Leadership for Corporate Directors, uh, what would be the best ways for them to uh, communicate? Finding me on Twitter at Joshua Nunziato is a great way to connect via social media. If you're interested in this course offering and would like to find out more, plugging CU Ethical Leadership for Corporate Directors into your favorite search engine would be a great way to find our landing page. And I would be happy to connect personally with anyone interested. Uh, Reach out, ping me on Twitter or follow the contact information available there on the landing page for our program to find out more. Josh, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me. And I do have one request, which is I hope we can continue this conversation. Hey, I really appreciate it, Tom. It's been a delight chatting with you. And thanks for having me on. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.